Has, has there ever been a more exciting time to be in general aviation? I mean, n not in my lifetime. Man, everything is exploding and it's so fantastic to see for our industry. And that is what we're all about at AOPA, as, as you guys know, hopefully all of you know. You know, this, this, uh, this general aviation in this country didn't happen by accident. It's the best place by far in the world to fly general aviation. People come from all over the world to fly here, to train here, to access the back country, and they do all of that through this general aviation. And in AOPA, that's basically what we feel our job is to protect it, to protect the perimeter, if you will. And that perimeter is everything involved in general aviation. And so billions to the economy, millions of jobs, and beside that, it's just a heck of a lot of fun. And so um, that's what we do, in essence, protect it, grow it, and keep it safe. And I had no idea before I came to AOPA how much general aviation is under attack. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's incidental. Sometimes it's a direct frontal attack from developers that want the land to protect airports. And the people that help protect that is, is primarily AOPA, engaging like we do from every level, from the city all the way up to the federal level. Our advocacy group has been named one of the top 50 advocacy groups in the nation for eight years in a row. If you think about that, all the stuff that goes on in this country, all the advocacy groups in Washington, and little bitty general aviation is one of the top 50. And our chief lobbyist, Jim Kuhn, has been singled out as one of the most effective lobbyists on Capitol Hill. That's the kind of power that we need to have to protect general aviation, and it doesn't happen by accident. This list in front of you is just a small list of the things that, uh, that Jim and his team fight for. You guys heard all about the unleaded uh, fuel issue earlier this morning, protecting airports. You heard earlier this summer about what the FAA came out with, the, you know, the misguided uh, principle on redefining what it meant for compensation for hire and training. I have a great deal of respect for the FAA, but sometimes they just flat get it wrong. And they need an advocacy group that's going to keep them on track and keep it from getting too loose on the rails. So that's part of what our advocacy group does to protect all the stuff that we're doing. One of the things I'm excited about is I'm a military guy, but I know that it's, it's uh, frustrating to have to fly around a mower that's not in use. And what we learned by looking into this issue is that the military themselves spends millions of dollars flying around their own MOAs that aren't in use. And I used to be an airspace scheduler inside the military, and I know that it's not really done with a fine pencil. It's kind of a broad brush. So we've gone to the military and just simply ask them. All we want you to do is be transparent about how much you use this airspace, and if you're not, give it back. And when it's not being used, we want to be able to see it so we can fly through it. So that's an initiative you'll probably see and hear more about uh, later through the year also. So this kind of thing, just protecting this valuable asset that we have that's truly a gem for our country, general aviation, that's what we're all about. And then, let's grow it. So the person that runs our You Can Fly program herself understands all these programs because she's pretty much lived them all. Elizabeth Tennyson, she's here in the crowd somewhere, earned her certificate on a budget, Rusty Pilot as she was a mom and grew her career and then back into flying. So she runs all these programs from her intuitive knowledge of what it's like to try to learn to fly in what can be a difficult environment. So we've had some real success with these programs to grow the general aviation population. Our Rusty Pilot has put 10,000 pilots back into flying. The important part of that is not just back like took a lesson or two, that 10,000 is back and went through a, um, a flight review and back actively flying with an active certificate. So um, our, our uh, flight school curriculum, if we want to grow the general aviation pilot, we've got to get to people earlier when they're making career decisions. So we developed a high school curriculum that's now in place in some 47 different states. And through that, we give over a million dollars in scholarships to teach people how to fly. But this high school curriculum is really exciting because it's totally free to the students. It's a turnkey curriculum. We present it to the school. We help educate them on how to teach it. It's sanctioned. It was built by instructors and by, uh, by flight instructors and by teachers. So it's a fantastic program that's going to help grow the next generation of pilots and get them excited about aviation at a younger age. Let's talk a little bit about safety. So we want to protect it. We want to grow it and we want to keep it safe. That's really the three principles from 82 years ago when AOPA was founded. 
Over about the last 25 or 30 years, we've dropped our fatal accident rate down by about half in general aviation. So this is a look at the accident rate. And then I want to show you a pretty exciting slide that also has a sobering piece to it. So I know this is hard to see. This laser pointer may not work. Oh, it works a little bit. So um, along the bottom are the years going back from 1989. And the red line at the top is the total number of uh, fatal accidents in the year. The blue line at the bottom is uh, at, at December in that year. So this was a point in time, the blue line at the bottom, and this snapshot was taken in December of 2021. So what you see is that in, tw in fiscal year 2021, we had the safest year ever in general aviation by a long shot. It was like 30% safer from a fatal accident standpoint than fiscal year 2020. And if you scratch your head and think about that, all of, all, all of us safety geeks were really wringing our hand about the pandemic because we thought dormant airplanes, bad for safety. Dormant pilots, bad for safety. Put them together, really big safety concern, right? Turns out fiscal year 2021 was the safest year ever in general aviation. And so we've launched an initiative inside the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee, which I co-chair with an FAA uh, counterpart, to figure out, you know, in safety, we spend so much time asking the question, what went wrong? We're trying to answer the question, what went right? How did we do that in a year where it should have been a pretty demanding year? The sobering piece of that is we came off of that fiscal year with having one of the worst first quarters of a fiscal year uh, in terms of raw numbers that we've had. Now, what may balance that out is it looks like that activity was way up in the, in the first part of the fiscal year for 2022 in comparison because perhaps weather trends or you know who knows so that may balance it out because again this is just raw numbers but here's a chart the general aviation joint steering committee we look at this and we track we set a goal to reduce fatal accidents by 10 percent over 10 years and so we track that and that black line is the glide slope and in this case being under the glide slope is a good thing so you want to be below the glide slope so you can see that um, at the as of the end of january um, we're, we're uh, basically five more fatal accidents than, than what we want to have at this point in the year to meet that goal. But at the end of December, we were 17 below that. So that's why in the safety world, we've learned to be a little bit patient with the numbers. A month or two or three months can have a blip and you can come back down. That's why I like looking at that historical trend chart that shows over time, we're just continuously dropping the fatal accident rate which means more people around holiday uh, dinner tables and more people attending seminars like this. Here's the primary accidents that you see, basically the top 10 accident causes in general aviation. It'd be loss of control, PowerPoint failure is number two there, but PowerPoint failure, it takes a little bit of an explanation. A lot of times that PowerPoint failure has to do with things like the pilot forgot to put oil back in the engine when they changed the oil, um, fuel starvation, uh, water in the fuel, things like that can cause PowerPoint failure. It's, it's typically really rare for an engine to just quit and fail. It usually has, usually has something to do with uh, a pilot mistake. And then CFIT, unintended flight into IMC, um, system component failure, non-power plant, then mid-air collision and fuel. Those are, those are basically the top 10 reasons uh, that we have accidents in GA. So, that's a little bit about how we're doing, what AOPA is up to. I'd love to talk to you more about that, but I'm going to ask your help, too. For us to protect general aviation in the way that we need to do it, when I came up through uh, aviation, when I soloed, I have a, a really uh, important picture to me and my dad. We're both sitting on our couch. We had soloed, not yet have our uh, pilot certificate. He's in a blue AOPA jacket. I'm in a red AOPA jacket because at that time, the instructors, when you soloed, they would hand you a little pamphlet that say, now that you're one of us, uh, you know, be part of the solution, join AOPA. So for us to protect this industry, we need to keep that membership strong and we need your help. So my ask to you is, a lot of instructors and trainers in the environment, help keep people feeding AOPA so we can keep protecting this thing. So I wanna chat with you today about a fun uh, conversation, sometimes sobering conversation because it is safety after all. Um, about why good pilots make bad decisions. And I want to share with you where this uh, came from. So throughout my career, 
Craig mentioned a military career. I started in GA, like many of us, you know, I would trade my cheap labor, sweeping a floor, or washing airplanes or whatever to, to learn to fly. And then I went and flew for the military. I flew F-15s. I was with the Thunderbirds and F-16s. I had a stint flying King Airs in the, uh, in the Philippines. And then um, I came back to, I was in industry for a while, and then I came back to, uh, to GA. But I flew GA all through that period. I would, I would fly general aviation while I was in the military. And um, what, I, what I would see, both in the military and in GA, is I would see pilots that I had a great deal of respect for, that I thought were better sticks than I was, and had better you know, sort of uh, mental sharpness than I was, and they would make mistakes airborne that you'd just scratch your head and go, what were they thinking? You know, how could, how could a pilot like that make a decision like that, with th that would cause that kind of an error, take that much risk? And I've thought about that for years, and I've thought if those people are susceptible to bad decisions at a moment in time, then so am I. And how can we defend against that? And all that chart I showed you of all those accidents, the root underneath that is almost all of them start with a bad decision the pilot made, either premeditated in the planning or in the moment. So let's just chat about that a little bit this morning. This comes from three books. Every year about the holidays, I start gathering books because I spend a lot of time over the holidays, just downtime, doing a lot of reading. And this started with this first book called Think Again. And it was a book about why uh, good leaders make bad decisions. And it was really business-based, you know, sort of Fortune 500 type companies. And I found it fascinating, but as I was reading it a couple years ago, I thought, now this would make a very good seminar topic for that topic that's bothered me for a long time. Why do good pilots make bad decisions? So that, you know, how these things happen. That book led me to the book on the bottom, Thinking Fast and Slow, which led me to the book on the right, uh, which Think Again. And all these books have to deal with the human decision-making process. None of them were in the aviation context, but it's real easy to map that across, and that's what we'll do this morning. So the, I'm reading those books, and about the, remember, it's over the holidays, and about the same time, this accident crosses my feed, and it was in Bartow, Florida a few years ago. Somebody in a Cessna 340, highly experienced pilot, IFR rated, a lot of time IFR, a lot of time in that airplane. It's Christmas Eve. He puts his family, and I forget exactly how many, I think there was four people total in the airplane, might have been more. He went out earlier, fueled the plane up, and the plan is they're going to fly down to Key West, have some breakfast, and then fly back. And the end point is they have to be back in the afternoon for Christmas Eve dinner with, where the whole family is coming in, traveling in from you know, all kinds of locations. So they have to be back for that. They go out the morning to take the flight out, and it's foggy in Bartow and his visibility of a quarter of a mile or less. The visibility is so bad that he has the airplane towed out because he doesn't feel like it's safe enough to taxi, but he has it towed out to where he can see the taxiway and then get on the, get on the runway. He, in essence, makes a zero-zero takeoff with his daughter and son-in-law or you know, some version of that on board, and they don't even make it to the airport perimeter. He gets up, loses control, and, and crashes, and everybody perishes. And as I read that accident, again, I'm reading kind of through these books as that came across, and that, that decision just hit me like, if you pause and think about that decision, what would cause a pilot to make a decision that was so fraught with risk with the people that he probably cherished most in his life on board the airplane? And so let's break that down a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about how the human brain works. And this comes from these two books, and I'll cite them down at the bottom there, you can see. But the, the way the brain works is there's really two systems that operate the brain. So there's system one, which is the system we use every day to make hundreds and maybe even, well, actually thousands of decisions. System one is the effortless process that the brain uses. System one is constantly operating. And it's the part, of the part of the brain that prefers to work. It prefers to operate in system one because system two, which is complex mental energy, is uh, draining. It costs a lot of energy, and just like any part of the body, it, it, it likes to conserve energy. It won't, the brain will not move into system two unless you kind of actively push it there. System one is like the Al Haig of the brain. It's in charge. It doesn't like to wake up system two. It doesn't want any help. 
So system one is that part of the brain when you're walking along and you're looking on your phone and you walk up and you hear a, a, a noise you know, coming off your left side, you stop, you look up, you wait for the bus to pass, and then you keep going. That effortless thinking. It's when you're flying your Super Cub and you mean to be maintaining level flight, but you're looking all around, enjoying the scenery, and you hear the RPM increase a little bit and the wind noise increases a little bit. And without even thinking about it, you just pull back on the stick a little bit because you know you're descending. That's been so well processed through your brain so many times it doesn't take any effort in figuring that out. You just do it without thinking about it. That's system one. It operate, it, we couldn't really live without it. It does almost all of our decision making most of the days. System two is that more effortful thinking when now you're flying you know, in whatever airplane you are and the winds increase a little bit, the weather's a little worse, so you're trying to figure out, do I climb, do I descend, can I make my destination, can I still make my alternate? You're well into system two when you start making those kinds of calculations airborne. And so what I want to chat with you today about is as we go through this topic is system one is not meant to be for airborne thinking. System one is optimized for two knots in one G walking around like we do every day, right? It's not optimized for 150 knots at you know, whatever altitude uh, we're flying at. So sometimes we have to be careful with effort, effortful work to push ourselves into system two and not let system one take up too much control of our thinking. Effortless thinking is a problem in aviation. So here's a little thing about system one, system two processing. Here's a little quiz, don't call out the answer. But a bat and a ball cost $1.10. If the bat costs a dollar more than the ball does, how much does a ball cost? Not a hard problem, right? 10 cents, if it costs a dollar more and they both collectively cost a dollar 10? Mm. No, that would, that'd be a buck 20. So the real answer is five cents. So the interesting part of that problem is 80% of us get that question wrong because we look at it and system one thinks it's a system one problem. Oh, this is easy, dollar more, it's got to be 10 cents for a dollar 10, move on, next issue. Just takes a little bit more to say, hey, stop and think about this a little, there's a little bit more to this problem, it's not that easy. Now what's really fascinating is 80% of us get this wrong in the general population. You know who doesn't get it wrong at the 80% level? Billionaires and Ivy League school people. They do much better at getting this answer right. And the theory is that they're better at waking up system two faster, looking for more complex issues and problems than the rest of us tend to just accept and move on. It's kind of a theory, but that's, that's the theory. The stat that they do better on the test is fact. So let's talk a little bit more about the brain before we can, uh, we'll look at some accidents where this may have been an issue. And that is our decisions are made through two processes in that the process is pattern recognition and emotional tagging. So typically the way it works is when we see something, the first thing the brain will do is try to tag it to something else is seen before and then it will have an emotional reaction. Was that good or bad? And this is kind of where the fight or flight mechanism comes from. You probably heard that before. Um, and there's some really funny stories about some Air Force pilots, you know, that we'd, I'd run into through my career through the years. And for whatever reason, they had to eject out of an airplane. And once they hit the ground, they talked about as soon as they hit the ground and got up, they just started running away from wherever they landed. And then after a few seconds, maybe a minute or whatever, they'd, they'd just kind of stop and go, why am I running, you know? And that's that, that's that processing where the brain says, uh, pattern recognition, I remember studying about this, and this is a bad scenario, emotional tagging, this is really uncomfortable, get out of here, you know, in whatever direction. So the challenge with that in aviation is that pattern recognition can lead us into making mistakes based on leaning on our experience too much. So what we tend to do is, oh, I've shot this approach before, this is my home field, I've flown into here before, and so we tend to rely on that experience a little too much, and then we tag that with an emotion that says, I'm going to my home airport, I'm gonna be sleeping at home tonight, I'm going to see my wife or my husband or whomever, and so that can lead us into making bad decisions because I'll ask you this, when in your flying career 
has the flight been exactly the same as it was previously? Craig mentioned that I've uh, led the Air Force Thunderbirds for a while, and I would get asked all the time, Did, don't, don't you get tired of flying that same profile over and over again? It's a 32-minute profile. And the answer to that was no, no, because it was so hard to do right. We had pretty high standards we'd fly to. And on any given day, the sun angle was different, the winds were different, the show line was different. I was in a different airplane. My wingman was in a different airplane. I wasn't feeling 100%. Maybe my wingman wasn't. All of these factors impacted how you would fly that profile. And so my offer to you is all of those factors should impact how you and your students assess any kind of flight that you take on any given day. In fact, when I talk to younger pilots, I tell them to be careful about flying with the experienced pilot where you're all together. I, I, I love to do a lot of backcountry flying. Where you're all together and somebody says, oh, don't, you know, the winds are up a little bit higher than maybe they should be or it makes you a little uncomfortable. And somebody says, oh, don't worry about it. I've flown into this strip a lot of times. We'll be fine. Make them explain to you what's different about today than the other times they've been there. And if you're the experienced pilot, pause and explain to yourself a little bit about what's going to be different about this flight. And that's a lot of times how we would brief that, that sortie in the Thunderbirds. Here's what's different about today's profile. And using that process will help you not lean too much on this experience and not lean too much on, I've done this before and it came out we'll, good, we'll be fine. A couple other things about how the, the human brain makes decisions and so how we process when we're airborne. We don't naturally consider all the alternatives. So you know this, this process we learn of, oh, you got a decision to make and you can't really decide, do, do the little column of the pros and cons, you know, and decide. That's a learned behavior. It's the, the brain does not naturally process information that way, which is why we had to learn it and why it's so hard to stick to it. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we leap to conclusions based on our experience and based on our emotions, and we tend to place too much emphasis on that experience and those emotions and not look for the differences in, in each scenario. We're heavily biased to subconscious inputs, and I'll talk about that, this notion of priming. There's a notion uh, uh, called priming and how you can prime your mind to accept or reject information. And in aviation in particular, um, that's, that can cause us an issue. This one I've seen over and over in uh, accident case studies. We're reluctant to revisit a decision once we've made it. So once we go through that mental effort of making a difficult decision, the weather's bad, you know, what's the fuel look like, and can I make it, can I not, how proficient am I, am I in a new airplane, am I, you know, when's the last time I went through recurrent training, whatever the case is. And then you look at all that stuff and you decide, I'll go. Here's the warning about that. You will be very reluctant to readdress that decision. Once you've gone through the mental effort of making a decision, your brain is reluctant to go back through all that information again and reassess all that effortful thinking that you did that was so exhausting, and it won't likely do it. We've seen that over and over again where pilots decide, I'll just go have a look. They take off and they go into worsening weather than when they were on the fence about going in the first place, and they continue. So uh, we have a tendency to very quickly shift into execution mode. And so this is what uh, this accident here that came up relatively recently. Now this is a preliminary, comes off a preliminary report. So just a cautionary there, you guys know how that works. Sometimes things can change and the accident can differ, but here's what we know about it so far. Two guys in two different airplanes, uh, the lead airplane was a 182, and they take off from somewhere in uh, Louisiana and the weather's sketchy. And they're briefing it on the ground. And they decide that, you know, the weather's kind of sketchy, they're both VFR pilots. Um, and they decide, well, let's head up, and I, I want to say it was uh, 150 miles or so, something like that, north into, uh, into Arkansas. And if the weather's bad, we'll divert to this uh, airport that was en route about 25 miles, 30 miles uh, upwards from where they were. And they're going to take off in, in trail. So they have, a, they have a good plan, you know. So their plan is the weather looks on the fence, so let's go up and have a look. And if the weather's too bad, we're going to divert into this field. They take off, and the pilot flying the trail is the one that survives. And when he takes off, he says, immediately the weather was worse than what we thought. 
When we got airborne, it's immediately worse. The visibility's worse. And so what do they do? They pressed on regardless. They go to their divert point, and as they get close to their divert point, the weather worsens, and they actually go IMC. They're two VFR pilots because they decide that they can press through, and it should be getting better. It, it looks like that's what they decided anyway. And not too long after, the lead pilot goes in a right-hand turn. He's not IMC trained, and it looks like a pretty classic case of somebody who becomes disoriented. That part's unknown yet, but it, it sure has that profile. And he doesn't survive. He impacts a nearby mountain. The trail pilot rolls his wings, gets a warning, a, a warning, 500 feet AGL warning, rolls his wings level and climbs, makes it to his destination, is in IMC almost the entire way. And so this is a, this is a classic case where we can sit here you know, at zero knots and 1G and look at these guys and scratch our head and go, what were they thinking? And the harder part of that is they had a plan. But it goes back to what I mentioned a few minutes ago. Once you make your initial decision, this notion that I'm going to go up and have a look very rarely results in me turning back. I had my look. wasn't what I expected, so I turned back. And if you can impact anything on both yourselves and your students, impact them on how important it is that very first decision they make, because you'll be unlikely to override yourself. And we as humans have a tendency to exaggerate any information that supports our decision and dismiss any information that maybe says we should reconsider. There was an accident not too long ago about somebody who I think was in a TBM uh, and was headed into uh, Wyoming. And he was coming back from recurrent training. He's trying to get home, he's got his wife on board, and he looks at the weather, and we know through conversations that he, that he had that he was on the fence, go, no go. While he's airborne, he makes a couple different decisions. I'm going to divert. No, I'm not going to divert. I really need to get my wife home to go pick up the mother-in-law or you know, some variation of that. So he finally decides he's going to continue, even though the weather was worse than when he made his initial decision and was on the fence. And then he's airborne, he diverts, decides I don't need to divert, and then the weather is worse than that, and he continues. And I would offer to you, don't look at that pilot and say, what a bad decision maker. Look at that and recognize that all that do is, because this guy was, this guy was a good pilot, had, had an experienced pilot was coming back from recurrent training. What I, I submit to you is look at that and say, if a person like that, it's so hard for them to reconsider a decision they make, it's going to be hard for me one day. And put um, mechanisms in place to protect it. Let's talk a little bit about bias and how that impacts our decision making. So this one was kind of entertaining when I read about that. There's something called plan continuation bias, which is basically what I just described in the, in the TBM accident. Once you've decided on a plan, you will have a bias to continue that plan. It's very difficult to recognize that. And the bias comes from two things. You will see what you want to see, and you will see what you expect to see. It's called confirmation and desirability bias. So I'm reading about these things in this book, and as I'm reading about that, I'm thinking to myself, uh, yeah, those, those guys that are biased, uh, that's a problem. You know, not me. I'm really, I'm really good. I'm not very biased. I'm, you know, I'm very aware of it. Like the next line, the guy goes, and those of you thinking that you're not very biased, you're the worst. You know? <laughs> and so then I thought, yeah, those guys that think they aren't very biased, man, they're, they're a problem. But um, so anyway, that, that is called the I'm not biased biased. And so the interesting thing about that is um, they've done some research where sort of more uh, people involved in more complex situations, more successful like CEOs and on that, that level, they do worse at reconsidering a decision than the rest of us. And the theory is because they have grown a lot of confidence in their decision-making ability. They've relied on it. It's moved them to where they are in life, very successful people. And so now they're good thinkers. They know they're good thinkers. So they're reluctant to go back and rethink something that they've already decided. So it turns out, if you're a good thinker, you're probably a lousy rethinker. And I would say most of the people in this audience probably fit in that category, a really good thinker. And so 
Now we just have to be aware that we're in that this is, this is actually a weakness of ours. We've got to be willing to go reconsider a situation that we've already assessed. So how do you do that? One thing is, and, and what the book offered was, consider your decision a hypothesis. And your hypothesis is, I can make this trip based on the data in front of me, which says the weather's this, the winds are that, my proficiency is this, and based on this data, I can make that trip. If the data changes, your hypothesis should change, right? So it's not a failure, you're not failing to execute, you're actually doing better because you're having the willingness to say, hey, wait a second, the data changed, my hypothesis has gotta change. So thinking about it as a hypothesis may help us uh, with this rethinking situation. So here's an, here's an accident that I was involved in personally. When I led the team uh, in 2003, we had an accident at Mountain Home in, uh, in Idaho. And um, the pilot was uh, number six, a solo pilot. His job was to take off and hit a certain altitude and do a split S and come back down the, the runway, the show line, in the opposite direction. He takes off, he rolls inverted, and he misses his altitude by about 1,000 feet. And he rolls inverted and pulls. He's 1,000 feet lower than he should be. Um, and, uh, and he ejects and survives. Now, that's a whole other story in itself. He survived, and it was miraculous. He ejected within uh, less than a second before hitting the ground and survived basically without a scratch, without a par you know, parachute, didn't open or anything. But the real vexing problem for this, with the, the Air Force ran an investigation, and we all knew why the accident happened. He rolled and pulled too early. But the question was, why did he do that? Um, and so the first thing we looked at was we went back and looked at all of his tapes. Was he cheating? Was he undisciplined? We looked at all his tapes and he would go up and ring the bell, which meant hitting your altitude and your airspeed minimum before you pulled through. And he would ring the bell within plus or minus about 50 feet over hundreds of times practicing this maneuver. And over all the tapes we reviewed, he never cheated. He never pulled down early. So we, we, we put that out. He didn't intentionally do it. So then the question was, how could he make a mistake so that, that big? And our theory is that he glanced down. It was a different show at a different density altitude. It was a hot day in Mountain Home, Idaho. So it was taking him a little bit longer, it should have, to get to altitude than it would normally have. So we think that he was probably off of his mental clock. It's about the right time to roll and pull. He goes off his mental clock. He glances down at the old style altimeter, you know, with the hands on it. And if you've ever glanced at one of your old, you know, analog watches and thought it was 2.30, but actually it was 3.30, in essence, we think that's what he did. Confirmation bias, saw what he expected to see, and then pulled through too early. So if it can happen to a guy like this, very talented, very experienced guy, a decision in a moment, I think, can happen to all of us is the lesson learned there. Here's a little bit more fun about intuition and how that can impact how we view different situations. So just take a look at the two boxes. You've got the one on the left there and the one on the right, and just mentally think to yourself, you know, read them. And then in the middle box there, just develop a mental picture of what Ann is doing. Just in your mind, visualize Ann, okay? So on the, um, on the left side, did you see uh, A, B, C, and on the right side, 12, 13, 14? Is that how you kind of mentally process that? So what's interesting about that is the figure in the middle is identical. And on the left side, your brain read it and processed it as a B. And on the right side, your brain read it and processed it as a 13. And so without any effort, system one says, I know, this is pattern recognition, I know what you want right here, context, you want to be on the left, you want a 13 on the right, it's the same figure, but it processes it for you, and you don't even really think, you don't even pause to think about it really. If you did that pretty, you didn't even really think about that, you know exactly what it was headed for. And the demonstration there is just an idea of how fast your brain will put stuff in context for you and not even bother you to think very hard about it. And my caution to you there is impromptu decisions. Impromptu decisions are so dangerous in aviation. We do so much, we do so well when we plan it out and we execute our plan and we go with contingencies. And yeah, every now and then there's things that happen that we fall back to or we move to. Yeah, that's sometimes part of the fun of aviation. 
But the impromptu decision I'm talking about is the decision to, in a moment, decide to fly down the river and, ha and have a look. Fly in a pine go, let's go fly down that river. Without any map study, without looking for wires, a tragic story about a, a, a man and his wife, um, I think it was a 182, might have been a 172 in the Midwest, take off and decide to fly down the river, but um, there's a, a wire there that they don't see on the river because they decide kind of up nice, having an evening flight, sort of sunset flight, and they decide they're just going to, oh, let's go drop down and fly down the river. Be careful of the impromptu decisions. Take, sometimes it's just 30 seconds to look at your map and say, would there be, is there a ridge here? Would there be any wires? Just pause for a second. Flying into the sun's not a great idea. If we're going to do that, let's put it at our back. We just did all that processing in 30 seconds, right? So be careful of the impromptu decisions of the things our brain will decide and put in context. We need to stop and pause about it in aviation. Now, what about Anne? So let me hear somebody from the audience, like, wh what was your vision of, of Anne? Where is she? Brick and mortar bank, approaching an ATM, something like that? Is that, what, is that what you had in mind? How about, did anybody have Anne sitting by a riverside on the bank of a river? Yeah, there's always, there's always like maybe 10% maybe of the audience that has that. About 90% of us pictured Anne walking up to an ATM or a brick and mortar bank. About 10% of the audience has Anne on a riverbank. What's the difference there? It's a concept called priming. The way the brain works is you can really prime how your brain thinks about things and operates by what you consume. So most likely, the people that had Anne approaching a riverbank have seen a picture like that recently. They were near a river. They were flipping through a magazine and saw a woman on a river. Something primed in their mind a woman on a river or a scene by a river. And so that was in their mind as they thought about this. This primed idea is kind of interesting. So, you know, if you, as a pilot, what you consume is important. So if you go to an air show, for example, and you go watch the U.S. Navy's Blue Angels fly, and then after that, you're going to go fly home, you're a danger to aviation. You're going to be walking around, dragging your knuckles, drooling, <laughs> shuffling, calling everybody mama. You won't be able to hold altitude or airspeed. Now, you got the same air show, and you watch the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds. It's a totally different story. You're going to have skills you never knew you had. So that's the whole idea of priming, and whoever the Navy guy's in the bar, I'll buy you a drink in the bar. So we had, the two teams had a lot, an awful lot of fun uh, with each other, very good relationship between the two teams. So um, one more concept I want to chat with you about, and that's this concept called cognitive ease. Cognitive ease is where if you, can, if you put the brain in a nice, comfortable place, so if you feed it with something that it's seen before, so it's not hard to think about it, if the information is presented in a clean and simple fashion, and then if you, if you can prime the idea like we just talked about, and you're in a good mood. So if all those things are in favor, then what tends to happen is you move to the right side where the brain says, ah, this feels familiar. Ah, this feels, this feels, yeah, this is all right. This, this is what we call our gut feel, our intuition, right? If these things are at play, we will have a tendency to say, oh, this feels right. This feels, feels true. Yeah, I've, I've done this before. My gut says this is a good idea. There's really no such thing as a gut feel. It's all coming from how the brain processes, processes things and how it's primed. Steve Jobs was really a master at this and how he did the font for how he developed Apple and all the iPhones. It's the reason why when you go in and talk to your boss, you present the material, you make sure they have coffee, you present the material in a nice, clean, simple fashion. Oh, look, boss, just give me my budget. This is an easy decision, right? Never works with Mark, but you know, it didn't, it didn't keep me from trying. Um, the causes of that is casual and superficial thinking, right? So we can have a tendency, like the couple flying the 182, Imagine you're, you're up, you decide to go flying for the evening, you're there with your wife, the sun's setting, it's a beautiful day, it's a bright sun, but no clouds in the sky, beautiful day, and you say, oh man, let's drop down and have a look at the river, that's an easy decision, right? Not so much, not in aviation. This one is uh, also something that probably happened from this cognitive ease standpoint. So this was a, a yak that happened in uh, Wyoming a couple years ago. 
and it was an older pilot flying with a young woman. She, I think she was a high school student that just earned her pilot certificate out flying with uh, her dad and um, his, his son, uh, some combination of that. And he's coming back into Alpine and decides probably, it's, it's really hard to tell, but his son was in front of him and he probably decides to join up on his son so they can either fly up initial at Alpine or maybe do a low approach at Alpine. That, that part's unsure, but um, something he had probably done, is flew out of Alpine, something he had probably done dozens, if not hundreds of times before in that. Very experienced pilot, very good. They were out doing some acro. But here's what was different about that day. Flat white conditions. Flat white snow over the reservoir that was where they, where they crashed over flat white all around Alpine, so as he drops down to accelerate to rejoin on his son, he probably doesn't realize how low he is. Well, obviously he didn't. So what was different about that day on a something he had done dozens of times before, flat white conditions, he makes a decision in a moment, let's go rejoin on my son, that impromptu decision cost him his life. So my caution to you is, there really is no place for impromptu decisions. Talk to the Patty Wagstaffs and the Michael Goulians and you look at all, all at what they're doing over there, nothing about that is impromptu. Every bit of that is scripted. So here's some things to think about in terms of our, uh, the consequences of our decision process and how we can sort of correct for it. This thing called intuition is very difficult to prevent. So instead of thinking, I'm not going to be biased, I'm not going to use my intuition, I'm better than that, it's very difficult. You're very unlikely to succeed with that approach. Recognize where mistakes are likely. Don't allow yourself the impromptu decision. And when the critical phases of flight have some form of a backup, whether it's you know, gear down a retractable airplane or whatever the case is, identify the critical elements of your airplane in your flight and have some kind of backup there so that you can uh, back yourself up if you get distracted. Remember, your brain is like any other, if you're tired and hungry, your brain will start shutting down. It'll let system one take a lot more information. It will be that much harder to wake up system two. So stay hydrated, bring those little kind bar snacks when you fly long distances, and keep yourself fed and hydrated. And the best way to do it is use standard operating procedures. So in the military and the airlines, it's kind of ironic, I think, because the people that fly every day for a living a lot of times have less judgment that they are allowed to use than we do in general aviation. So I can tell you when I flew in the, mili in the military, and airline guys will tell you the same thing, the weather, the winds, the state of your airplane, all of that is out of your hands. Dispatch does all that. Operations does all that. There's procedures for all of that. You follow the procedures. If you don't, you're not going to stay there very long. In general aviation, we're the chief finance officer, chief maintenance officer, we're the captain, we're the dispatch, we're the chief weather officer. Every bit of that is up to our judgment. When I flew the F-15 in the military, I, if there was a hydraulic leak on my airplane, then people down the end of runway would sit there, train technicians and time it and see how many drops, hydraulic drops per minute, and then based on however many they counted, I could either go or not go. That was their decision. I had nothing to do with it. I used to fly a Navion and own a Navion, and that thing, if it wasn't leaking hydraulic fluid, it didn't have any in it, you know? <laughs> so just learning the judgment there about when and not to take your airplane is completely within our hands in GA, and that's something that we can help ourselves with by establishing a standard operating procedure, whereas minimums that we will fly in or won't fly in, you do those at zero knots in 1G, it, you sign them. We in the Air Safety Institute have those contracts. You can download them for free. And then you don't change it until you're back at zero knots in 1G talking to somebody else. You can't change it airborne. If you allow yourself the flexibility to change it airborne, you always will when you shouldn't. You always will. You'll talk yourself into, ah, it's not that bad. I can do it. <clears throat> this cognitive ease, remember that we talked about that and how that can cause careless errors and there's really no place for that in aviation. And the rest of the stuff, the overweighting, the, reins the reinsurance, the best way to think about that is to remember that if there's a new set of information, then we owe it to ourselves to reprocess the decision. Our decision, after all, was a hypothesis. We hypothesized that we could make this trip based on the data available to us. If that data changes, 
our decision should change. And remember uh, how heavily influenced we are to previous assessments in the, the emotional attach attachment issue. So that's a little bit about why good pilots make bad decisions and my ask of you to help both in your own flying and as you bring people up in the training aspect and as you're teaching people of how to identify uh, ways to help people improve their airborne decision making. In the Air Safety Institute, we put out a lot of free information uh, in 2021 or 2020, uh, the year of the pandemic, when it first started, our information was accessed 12 million times. So you can follow us on the YouTube channel. You can follow us. We have a podcast called There I Was. It's been downloaded over 3 million times. It's a lot of fun. We bring pilots in, and they tell us stories of challenges they've had flying and how they flew out of them. We've had Patty Wagstaff, Michael Goulian, Kenny G. Uh, so we've had a lot, of, a lot of interesting things there. It's free. It's on iTunes and Spotify. So our, our uh, strategy is very much like John was talking about earlier. If you want to impact how pilots fly, you have to influence how they think, and you can't do that unless you reach them. And a lot of instructors in this room, and you know that, every student is different. You have to reach them with compelling, interesting material, or else you won't ever make it to the point where you're influencing them. That's what we try to do in ASI. We're on every channel available out there. You can access us on mobile devices, and we love feedback. So visit it, consume our material, offer it to your students, and, uh, and give us some feedback. And that's all I have for you this morning. Thank you for your time.